Now on ITV, what price for speed? Tonight asks, high speed rail, is it worth it? Tonight, the £56 billion future of Britain's railway. There's no other major infrastructure planned in the next 30 years in the country that will do what HS2 does. A high-speed revolution or public spending off the rails? It was going to cost about 30 billion, then it was 56. It's ridiculous, it's scandalous, and it should be stopped. And the winners and losers of HS2. None of it stacks up. The whole HS2 project itself doesn't stack up. I used to come home from work with a real buzz, and now I come home just thinking, well, what's going to happen? How much longer are we going to be here? My dream home gone. Good evening and welcome to the Tonight programme. With the government finally approving a third runway at Heathrow, focus now shifts to the biggest public infrastructure project of them all, High Speed Rail 2. The new railway will connect London to Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds, enabling trains to travel at up to 250 miles per hour. But projected building costs are rocketing. Tonight, Jonathan Maitland asks, is High Speed 2 really worth it? Commuting in Britain often feels like torture. Traffic jams, city centre buses crawling along, and train delays. Welcome to Gridlock Britain. But now the government are planning to do something about it. It's the biggest railway project in a generation, and it's called High Speed 2. The plan is to build a new super-fast line from London to Birmingham, with a second phase linking in Manchester and Leeds. With trains travelling at up to 250 miles an hour, it's expected to take just 68 minutes to get from London to Manchester, and the London to Birmingham journey will be cut by around 30 minutes. HS2 say they'll carry up to 300,000 passengers a day, taking the strain off our overloaded railways and congested roads. There's no other major infrastructure planned in the next 30 years in the country that will do what HS2 does. But it's not all good news, especially if you suddenly discover that your home lies directly in its path. <coughs> Most people in the South Yorkshire town of Mexborough had never heard of HS2. That was until July this year. And now residents can't think of anything else. The day they go by, I don't break down. I just don't want to come home. I don't want to be here anymore. Despite some having moved in only weeks before, around 400 residents of this brand new housing estate received letters in July that would leave them devastated. It is likely that the government would need to acquire some or all of your land or property in order to construct the railway. Becky Quartermain was one of them. I got up to take the dog for a walk and there was a piece of paper shoved through the letterbox. And I opened it and I thought somebody was joking. I really thought somebody was going to jump out and say, surprise. Yeah, my dream home gone. I used to come home from work with a real buzz and now I come home just thinking, well, what's going to happen? How much longer are we going to be here? And the worry of finding another house this nice in a nice area like this, yeah. I cry frequently. The letter goes on to say the exact details for construction won't be known until 2020, but if it goes ahead as planned, it'll carve a path straight through the estate, a problem that councillor Sean Gibbons says will have an enormous impact on not just these residents, but the whole community. It's no good for the town because the town aren't going to benefit. They're going to have an absolute nightmare for 10 years of disruption. Many residents are on a heap with worry, with stress, not knowing what's going on. 
Building work on the estate has ground to a halt, houses lie half-built, and the residents are dismayed by HS2 and what they say is a lack of information. We've emailed them many questions regarding what's going to happen. They're just trying to save money in case we do need it for more solicitors' things and, and bills. We can't go on holiday, we can't do anything. HS2 are treating residents in our town with contempt, arrogance and incompetence. They're not even giving the minimal information, they're not communicating as they should. It's absolutely disgraceful. It's an absolute shambles. So David Higgins is the man in charge of HS2 and responsible for making this project a reality. I've got the letter here that you sent to a housing estate, a new one in Mexborough. It's anonymised, it says, dear resident. Can you imagine what it's like when you've just moved into your, yeah. your house, the home of your dreams, and yeah. then this comes through the door? Uh, I agree. It, it is very difficult and I, I fully understand. I would hope that we can get a clear, simple decision so that those people that do want to move on can avail themselves of the schemes that are put in place. We'll do everything we can and we'll work very, very closely with the communities. We're, we're very uh, sympathetic of the disruption this causes when it does directly impact communities. You say you're sympathetic, but they're saying that they're not getting any response from you. And so actually they're saying there's a bit of a brick wall. Uh, we have a lot of our staff up there on the ground. The feedback I get is that the staff are doing a very good job. This isn't the end of the line. Um, we have a process we go through. We hopefully will start consultation within the next few months. What we've shown on phase one is, if there's a smarter way, we do change. And we've got a whole history of doing that. So I would encourage communities to continue to actively engage with us and look at our history of trying to find better solutions. But who will use the new line? In an exclusive tonight's survey, we found that less than 17% of people across the country thought they'd use it. Only 11% believed it would benefit the majority of commuters, and when asked if they were prepared to pay more for the service, 60% said no. Of course, HS2 isn't Britain's first high-speed line. That title goes to HS1, the link from the Channel Tunnel to St Pancras Station in London. Original forecasts for international passengers on HS1 were that by 2009, up to 30 million of us would be using it each year. But in reality, it was about 10 million. Jenny commutes from Gravesend in Kent into London several times a week, but mixes her journeys on HS1 with the local slower line. You don't use HS1 as often as you could do. Why is that? because of the cost and because it's so expensive. So it all depends on the urgency of what I've got to do in London. It's a third extra sometimes. Exactly, yes. For season ticket holders, the price difference is substantial. From Gravesend into London, it's £3,328 on the slow line and £4,428 on the high speed line, over £1,000 more expensive. So how much time do you save yourself when you get on HS1? It's the equivalent of about an hour, I would say yes. It would say about an hour I save. I love to use HS1 all the time, but really, I can't afford to use it all the time. I might as well wake up early, get on the slower train and save myself that money. Which is ridiculous, because it's absolutely designed for people like you. Yes, well, obviously not, because really, people like me now can't afford it. Well, you can a bit, but <laughs> certainly not all the time. Yeah, not all the time, yes. There is undeniably a premium charged for using the service, although HS1 chairman Rob Holden says it's a success. I mean, one of the criticisms of HS1 is that some people would like to use it all the time, but they can't because it's too expensive. In that respect, has it been as much of a success as you claim? Um, in terms of the domestic commuter traffic, yes, it is more expensive than um, the alternative, but there's also a huge time saving. So for somebody travelling from Ashford, they save potentially two hours a day, an hour each way. There's a value to that. In peak periods, it's standing room only on these trains. Um, here this afternoon, this is a busy train. Um, people like it. It's, it's reliable and people are also prepared to pay for reliability. Railways in this country are very costly and our governments do not subsidise them to the same extent that railways are subsidised across Europe. So the bottom line is, if you're a commuter and you want to halve your journey time, you've got to pay for it. Yeah, what's wrong with that? Forecasted passenger numbers are crucially important in working out operating costs. 
and critics consider that HS2 figures are wildly optimistic. All you have to do is look at HS1 in Kent. Last year, they celebrated having 10 million passengers a year, but they were meant to be having 25 million passengers by now. The Public Accounts Committee reported and said, this is going to cost the country 10 billion pounds more than it was expected because the passengers haven't turned up. The biggest issue with a project like this is cost. The original budget was supposed to be 30 billion pounds. But now it looks like topping 56 billion, with the Taxpayers' Alliance claiming it could even reach 90 billion. The price of it, how much higher is it going to go? Uh, well, it's altogether a 500 kilometres of railway line. Uh, it's a massive amount of new capacity. I would challenge you and think, in 25 years' time, people will say, uh, how much did we invest in HS2 and how much did we invest in, say, bailing out the British banks, for example. HS2 is about the same as bailing out one British bank. And I would think, so what's the legacy? Legacy in skills, connectivity, employment, changing the community. Nevertheless, some people will say, you know, 50, 60 billion that could be spent on roads, on the NHS, on schools. What would you say to them? It is. That and much more is being spent on roads every year. And if you look at it as an annual expenditure, it's a tiny part of the 800 billion pounds the government spends every year. And if you want to know what 56 billion looks like, here's a clue. This football stadium has approximately 56,000 seats. If you put a million pounds on every single one of them, that would be the cost of the new superfast line. And according to our survey, it seems that HS2 has a long way to go to convince people that it's a good thing. When we asked if the multi-billion price tag was worth it, only 15% said yes. 77% thought the money would be better spent on other areas, like the NHS. If it's such a good idea, why do the polls suggest that, that so many people are against it? New ideas are always challenging for the public to accept. I ran the Olympics, all the major newspapers, even when the Olympics had started, criticised it. It's very difficult to explain to people what the future can be. Rail travel is more popular than ever in the UK, with almost 1.7 billion passenger journeys between 2015 and 2016. The government say that HS2 will free up capacity and reduce congestion on the older, classic commuter lines. But some argue we could be making more of the services than we already have. Professor Tony May has spent his working life in transport engineering and says he doesn't believe that that option has been properly explored. In practice, the routes that HS2 would serve, Euston in particular, are among the least congested of any of the approaches to London. Virgin West Coast is operating at about a 50% load factor at the moment, so there's 50% growth. You could add to the capacity at relatively low cost by extending train lengths and also by some uh, re-signalling. And that would cost a lot less than building HS2. HS2 won't be fully operational until 2033, and by then, the country will probably look very different. Emerging technologies like virtual reality could have a huge impact on commuter numbers, even without an HS2. The digital revolution has been slow to affect the railways, but young tech entrepreneurs at Hack Train in London are linking with train operators to help all of us get the most from our current services. What we do here at the Hack Train is we bring together the very best technology companies with the very best real, real companies and we essentially work with them in actually implementing new technology on trains, stations, websites and apps. What we've been doing is counting the number of passengers on a specific carriage using our uh, camera technology and relay that information back to passengers and say, hey look, carriages A, B and C are busy, but if you actually go to carriages D and F, they're actually half empty, you can get a seat over there. Um, this is a problem that you know, rail has had for years, and now finally you know, when the train operators have kind of stepped up to the table and said, hey, we want to introduce new technology to address this problem. Of course, in order to complete High Speed 2, 350 miles of track need to be laid, inevitably impacting on countryside and villages along the way. It'll have huge consequences on the county of Buckinghamshire. 
The controversy around the line has seen the rise of protest groups like Stop HS2, who say it's because the trains will be travelling up to 250 miles an hour that the environmental impact is so great. Because 250 miles an hour was picked out of the air for no reason whatsoever, it maximises the environmental devastation of HS2 because it can't bend, so it can't miss sensitive environmental sites, ancient woodlands. They're all for the chop because HS2 cannot go round them like a normal railway would. When you look at the plans for it, you realise what a disaster it is. It's really irresponsible that this is being done because once things like this are gone, they're gone forever. The Wildlife Trust and the Woodland Trust are worried about the effects building the line will have, and they say the threat is to scarce and irreplaceable woodlands along the route, which are of national importance. Well, this woodland's at least 400 years old. It's been on the earliest maps that we've got. Ancient woodland is irreplaceable. Once it's gone, it's gone, that's it. Part of the problem is they didn't properly assess the route when they came to decide on this corridor that they've chosen. This is supposed to be a national infrastructure project. It's a flagship project. It should be done to the highest possible quality. And it sends a very poor message to other developers about the approach taken to ancient woodland. HS2 have been buying up land along the route, spending around £417 million so far. Part of it will travel straight through this field near Great Missenden in the Chilterns, leaving much of the land unsuitable for farming. I've been farming here all my life. I'm a third generation farmer. Well in excess of 100 years we've been here. Robert is a tenant, so doesn't actually own the land. If it's sold off, his life on this farm will be at an end. HS2 cutting straight through the middle of this prime 100 acre spot that I grow bread making wheat on, that is going to make it absolutely useless for anything. HS2 have bought up a lot of the properties. We've got one property here down in the middle of our fields that they bought about eight or nine months ago, and now we've just heard that they bought a small farm below that. So HS2 is absolutely surrounding me now. And he's another claiming that HS2 have been far from sympathetic. When HS2 came, they was very sure of themselves and saying that, Mr Brown, you're going to have to make the best of what's left. I was absolutely devastated. You know, you put your sole livelihood into this farm and get it working as good as you can to get some people sit around your table and tell you what they're going to do with it. You know, without even asking you, I've not come across such horrible, nasty people as what they are. I don't know where they found them from. Must have dug them up, I should think. HS2 told us, we agree with Mr Brown that, subject to local planning approval, we will use an alternative plot of land for those works that can be moved. We understand the emotional and financial impact that the HS2 line has on those affected by the route. We're sorry that Mr Brown doesn't feel that has been reflected in his dealings with HS2. The Woodland Trust say that 63 ancient forests are either threatened or are going to be destroyed. Uh, is there any way of avoiding that? It's a balance of minimising impact on communities, getting close to houses, to woodlands, right through to historic um, buildings and churches. So we're trying to weave this line to have a minimal impact on that. But there is actually an enormous opportunity when you look at the amount of um, land that we will take back into reforestation and connect it to existing. So we will work with the Woodland Trust to make the most of this big investment. One of the central aims for such huge government investment has been to improve or rebalance the economy outside London. But only 33% of the people we surveyed felt that the North would benefit. 52% thought London would still come out on top. This is Birmingham New Street Station. It's been totally revamped and is at the heart of a regeneration scheme that cost £600 million. It's the model that council leaders across the Midlands and the North hope to emulate with money from HS2. Well, HS2 is a real game changer, not only for the city, but for the whole of the region. Just the HS2 station in Birmingham alone will create 36,000 jobs. It will help deliver 4,000 new homes and uh, give an economic boost to the city of £1.4 billion. So it's a real game changer for both the city and the region. 
In order to justify the massive cost to the taxpayer, HS2 have to prove it will stimulate significantly more economic growth. They say the return on investment could boost the nation's economy by £15 billion every year, with much of that following the route north. But the Public Accounts Committee in 2013 said HS2 had failed to show sufficient evidence to prove the business case. I think the calculation of benefits to the north of England are extremely tenuous. This is a complicated area to analyse, but there's far more evidence suggesting that London will benefit by being able to tap the economic resources of the Midlands and the North than that the Midlands and the North will uh, attract economic activity from London. But one thing it would certainly do is create jobs building it. 27,000 claim HS2, and these are highly skilled, well-paid roles, including up to 9,000 apprenticeships. Here at Aston University Engineering Academy, they're training the next generation of engineers. 20-year-old student Anissa is hoping she'll have a career working on HS2. She's talking about things moving along, but it'd be no different than training. It's my dream job to work for HS2. The jobs in HS2 range from civil engineers to technicians to railway system engineers and being able to go on site and see what's going on, what needs to be done and how it's all intertwining and how it's all connecting from Birmingham to London. That's definitely what I want to do. The money being spent on HS2 is definitely worth it. It's young people that it's going to affect and it's our generation that want it to go forward. It isn't something just for the current period, and it's not just for now, it's investing in the future, it's investing in young people because it will provide job security. We need it. But the debate over HS2 rages on. The House of Lords are currently looking at the bill for Phase 1, with building work expected to be given the go-ahead for next year. Phase 2 will be subject to consultations before being put to Parliament, with building work expected to begin in 2020. Until then, communities like those in Mexborough will continue to fight to have their homes saved from the bulldozer. Uh, you can click onto the link. None of it stacks up. The whole HS2 project itself uh, doesn't stack up. This is an absolute waste of money. I would certainly not spend 56 billion on HS2. Indeed, I don't think I would even be prepared to spend half of that sum. And if that is going to go ahead. This thing is going to be a burden on taxpayers through the subsidies that it is going to require throughout its lifetime. Everyone in the country will be subsidising a railway that will only benefit the richest in society. HS2 will change the whole way the UK operates. It will be transformative. It has a chance to reposition the communities of the north of how they see themselves and how they interact with the rest of the world. The truth is that forecasts on both sides of the debate are generally educated guesses. And just who will really benefit from the billions due to be spent won't be fully understood until the line is open for business in another 17 years. The House of Lords are expected to give their approval in a few weeks' time, with building due to begin next year. Now, if you'd like to see more results from our exclusive Tonight poll, then visit our website at itv.com slash tonight. In the meantime, good evening and thanks for watching.